please. I think it's the first time I've ever been live streamed. It's exciting. Right. So, all right, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the next uh, talk of this graduate course on the cell molecular control of cell death pathways. It's a great, great pleasure for me to introduce the next speaker. Professor Jean, Jean Mulcahy Levy is an associate professor and a pediatric hematologist oncologist at the University of Colorado School of Medicine in Denver. Jean's research interests focus exactly on the subject of her presentation today, autophagy, which is primarily a survival process. I should emphasize, I know Jean would, would do that as well but uh, may precede or contribute to cell death uh, in particular circumstances. And because it's possible to interfere with these survival mechanisms, Gene's group is working very hard on combined therapies to prevent autophagy, along with more conventional treatments such as radiation and uh, chemotherapy against cancer. I'm sure we will all enjoy and learn a lot with Gene's talk today. So thank you so much, Jean, again, for participating and contributing to our graduate course. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, the slides, I'm sure that Gustavo will, um, will be able to make them available to you. And I put my um, email address here. So if you guys have any questions or anything's confusing, you're welcome to message me after the talk. Wonderful. So let's get started. Um, so I'm just going to put some learning objectives up here and we'll re come back to these at the end of the talk. Um, and we will um, look to understand the differences between the main types of autophagy. So we'll talk about the different kinds that there are. But the two main types are macro autophagy and chaperone mediated autophagy. Um, we're going to understand the process of macro autophagy. We're going to talk about the rationale about autophagy's protective mechanisms against diseases such as neurodegeneration. We're gonna talk about how autophagy is related to cancer because this is, um, we're gonna use this as a model because this is the area where we're most like going to um, inhibit autophagy. And then we're gonna understand how autophagy can be altered to treat diseases. So, Probably the first thing to note is there's been a lot of work in autophagy. Um, and in 2016, the Nobel Prize in Medicine um, or Physiology was awarded to Dr. Oshumi um, for his work in the characterization of autophagy and how um, it was important in health and science. And so one of the things that we're going to do, we're going to try this. This is just a cute, it's just a couple minute video. We're going to watch it real quick about why autophagy won the Nobel Prize. It's just gonna give you a general overview of things and then we'll delve into the details. Autophagy, why do we need it? This is Paul. Every day he reads his favorite newspaper, but over time, a giant stack of paper collects in his house. Only the recycling truck can save him from drowning in yesterday's news. But what happens to his paper afterwards? Much of it is reconstituted for new uses in the cycle we call recycling. But long before we began recycling our trash, nature was following the same principle. Even the cells in our body recycle their trash. There, the cycle is called autophagy. Cells eliminate invading viruses and bacteria, but also harmful protein aggregates and old or damaged parts of the cell's nucleus that are no longer needed. The process of breaking these things down involves two liquid-filled structures inside the cell. The autophagosome collects the trash and transports it to the lysosome. The lysosome contains digestive enzymes that finally separate the cellular junk into its component parts. But don't worry, nothing goes to waste. These broken down parts are turned into new cell components that can be used again. This has many advantages. Our body's natural resources are conserved, we save energy, and our cell's trash can never overflow. But sometimes, the trash isn't disposed of correctly. This can cause diseases such as infections with certain forms of viral influenza, Alzheimer's, or cancer. 
But how is autophagy controlled? Paul found the answer in one of his newspapers. The Japanese biologist Yoshinori Osumi was doing research about 25 years ago when he made a major discovery. He was investigating the genes of simple yeast cells. In various experiments, he kept changing those genes in order to test the effect this would have on the cell's recycling process. Eventually, he found 15 genes in the yeast that were responsible for different stages of the autophagy process. Then he was able to apply his finding to human cells, which is why he received the 2016 Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine. There are still many puzzles and secrets about autophagy, but scientists are working on decoding them. Paul is relieved to know how important his built-in recycling system is for keeping his cells healthy. What a cool movie, Jean. Yeah, so um, that is just a fun movie. Very just nice. kind of, yeah, just in a fun overview. So, um, oops. So it, I think, you know, the, the goal here and the bottom line message that I want you guys to take home from this talk, and please, if you guys have questions, break in, you know, this is very, very um, conversational. So break in if you want to ask a question. So really the bottom line message that you'll take home is that autophagy is really important across biology and disease processes. And we are already manipulating it to treat human illnesses. And we know that we're using the lysosomes um, to degrade and recycle material within the cell, but you have to have autophagy in order to deliver the material to the lysosome. So this is just an example, you know, this just shows you the lysosome. You've got all these great hydrolases in there, but you can't do anything with them unless you combine this lysosome with something that carries um, uh, proteins or organelles that need to be degraded. So there's three main types of autophagy. So macro autophagy, which is the one that most people are thinking about when we talk about autophagy. There's something called micro autophagy, which is where the lysosome itself just sort of um, picks up little pieces of things and then degrades it. And then there's chaperone mediated autophagy, which is associated with specific um, substrates that you want to degrade. So basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to take um, a very specific item, get it to a lysosome so that very specific thing is degraded and recycled. Oops. So when we look at the three main types of autophagy, there's some very specific differences that we want to remember. So macro autophagy. So if most people say autophagy, they're thinking macro autophagy. And this is the one that's most studied. And this is the one where you form a double membrane vesicle that sort of um, uptakes proteins, organelles, mitochondria, different things within the cell, becomes an autophagosome, which binds to the lysosome, and then we get the breakdown of the material. The microautophagy, again, this is the lysosome directly taking up um, cargo, and it's random. There's nothing organized about this. Whatever gets taken up is what gets taken up. And then both of these are different. Both of these are random, right? So they just pick up whatever they're going to pick up. When you get to chaperone mediated, you're going to get recognition of specific proteins. And there is a specific recognition, recognition sequence based on the amino acid sequence KFERQ. And what happens is, is you get this KFERQ recognition sequence directly binding to a chaperone protein of some kind. And then this substrate is delivered directly to the lysosome in order to be degraded. So most of today's talk or the rest of today's talk really is going to talk about the concept of macro autophagy, a little bit of chaperone mediated in here, but mostly about macro autophagy. So when we think about this, it's genetically programmed, um, very organized, it's evolutionarily concerned, conserved, sorry. So it, we know it is involved from yeast to flies to mammals. Everyone gets their own kind of autophagy. It was first described in the 1960s. So we've known about it for a really long time. We know that it's what allows lysosomal degrad degradation of our intracellular molecules. And for the most part, it's bulk degradation of proteins and organelles, which is unregulated. Remember, like I said, it's these things are being picked up um, randomly of whatever it, whatever it picks up at the time. 
So this is the first example of autophagy that was published. It was published in 1962. And they wrote, in some instances, the contained mitochondria is essentially normal. So that would be um, a mitochondria in an autophagosome before it meets the lysosome. In others, it shows varying degrees of structural decay. So once you get the lysosome um, combined with the autophagosome, you get the decay. So what you can see here in this image is this is your double membrane. And you can see how it engulfs this organelle. And that essentially, eventually this would bind with your lysosome, which you could pretend that this is the lysosome. These are gonna to come together and then this will break down. So that's a pretty amazing picture, especially considering how long ago it was that they um, found this process. So this is, um, you know, if you wanna study sort of macroautophagy, this is a really great slide to remember because this shows you all the steps and sort of all the things that are involved in it. So there's multiple steps. We think of initiation, nucleation and formation, expansion, fusion, and degradation. So five total steps in the process. And the beginning steps and the middle steps, these are really the ones that have a lot of um, proteins interacting to sort of create different stuff. So you can um, control autophagy, you can upregulate it through the AMP kinase pathway, you can downregulate it, sorry, that's my puppy, you can downregulate it through mTOR. And what you're doing is once you get a signal, either through AMP kinase or you release the, the process by inhibiting mTOR, you get autophagy initiation. And this initia initiation runs through this ULK1 initiation complex. This involves multiple proteins, including the ULK1, ATG13, and ATG101. And it combines with this PI3 kinase nucleation complex. And this includes VPS34, VPS13, ATG14, and Becklin1. You get ATG9, which is going to bring lipids, allowing it to um, form the membrane. And then you get this PI3P binding complex, which comes together and you get um, involving ATG 16L1, ATG 5 and 12, which are really important, ATG 7 acting as your enzyme. And these all come together to produce this phagophore, which is basically this double membrane um, isolation membrane. And this, you can see it starts to come around our mitochondria or different things. And then you start involving this ATG12 conjugation system. So this is also really important is that the LC3 system, which takes LC31 um, to LC32 through this LC3 um, conjugation system. Again, we're using ATG7, where we were also using it over here. We're also using ATG4. And this LC3 then becomes bound and helps to build this double membrane. So you go from isolation membrane to phagophore to autophagosome, which is when the membrane is complete. And then once your autophagosome is complete, it's carrying different things that it wants to break down, it's going to come and fuse with the lysosome. Once you fuse, then it's an autophagolysosome and then the lysosome is able to release its hydrolases and um, degrade all of these products. What's not shown in this figure is once these are all degraded, this is, these are the recycled things that can be released back into the cell to be used for different things. So this is sort of your complete picture of, autophag of autophagy. Now, we know that there's many positive and negative ways to manipulate autophagy, and we'll talk about that more in detail a little bit later. But what you can see is, is that you can hit the process early in the process, in your initiation and in your um, development of your um, isolation membrane. You can hit it sort of here in the middle. You can also hit it here at the end. And so this is what makes the process so appealing to um, manipulate in people and try and use it to treat um, different diseases. And we know that there's many drugs that are um, affecting autophagy. So this is just a, a, a basic list of different drugs and things that we know already that we're using in people and we're manipulating autophagy and not even thinking about it. So for example, we use 
uh, the mTOR inhibitor Everolimus to treat um, a tumor in the brain called a subependymal giant cell astrocytoma or a SEGA. And we don't think about it as, as we think about it as an mTOR inhibitor, but we treat um, lots of patients with this, but without thinking anything about what we're doing to the autophagy system. Radiation is the other, you use radiation in lots of different diseases. And so we want to really understand what it is we're doing with these um, diseases and the people that we're treating with these agents. And so let's talk about the key role of autophagy in adults. And so one of the things that we know is that autophagy is really important in things like nutrition management, weight, that kind of thing. So I don't know if you guys have heard about um, this concept of um, fasting, or it's really popular these days to think about, well, if I fast, um, it will do lots of great things for my body and I can lose weight and be healthier. And, you know, that's true. If you, if you um, do that, it can happen, but let's look at what, why it's important. So we know that autophagy is recycling proteins and other macromolecules, um, specifically under nutrient deprivation. That's how you get the recycling of your amino acids, your fatty acids, your nucleotides, all of these things that your cell's gonna need to survive. It's gonna remove things like mitochondria and peroxisomes once they need to be recycled if they're damaged or no longer working. It's what allows us to survive under stress conditions of different types. We know that it's involved in antigen presentation, so protecting us from infection. We know also that it's involved in neuroprotection. So let's take a look at some of these. So autophagy is induced during times of stress. So think about um, when you're born, you have the umbilical cord, it's giving you constant food, it's never stopping, and then all of a sudden that process is cut. So here it is, you're getting lots of food, lots of food, you're born, you lose the umbilical cord and you lose that continuous feeding. And then all of a sudden you have to be able to induce autophagy in order for your cells to survive. The same process happens in starvation. You're eating lots of cookies. You're having lots of fun. You go out, you forget your lunch at school or at home and you get to school and you starve during the day because you have no food. And the reason you survive to get home until you have your food and dinner is because you're um, autophagy system increases. So this in, introduces this concept of the induced autophagy versus baseline autophagy, right? So baseline autophagy is always working in your cell. Every cell in your body has some, it's always working to maintain um, a clean space with inside itself, take away the trash like it's had in that little video. But you also have this concept of induced autophagy, which is going to um, produce nutrients um, when you're starved or stressed in some way. And you can see this if you look at ATG7 knockout mice. So remember ATG7 was used in two different spots in that middle of that process. And if you have um, ATG7 that's working, you can see here in this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy that they have autophagy and their body weight is pretty good. But this little guy didn't have autophagy and unfortunately, wasn't able to um, get to a body weight that would um, be good for him. So, you know, it really is important. And you can also see that this guy who had most, the most HEG7 is sort of your biggest. So you're surviving in between meals, when you go to sleep, all that other kind of stuff because you have autophagy active in your body. So, the key roles of autophagy, we think about it in adults, is protection against infection and protection of your nerve cells or your brain. And we know this because if you take mice, again, we're looking at this ATG7, it's required to have a successful autophagy. If you turn it off, you take away ATG7, they've um, removed that gene from the, from the mice, and then you monitor them for survival, they don't live as long. So a normal mouse is going to roll along and he's, you know, three and a half months old. But what happens is, is you have this early death where these mice die from infection, they get sickness, they're not able to protect themselves. And then they do well for a little while and you get this delayed death. And this death is from um, neuro, uh, neurodegeneration or, or decreasing um, function of their uh, nervous system.
This is how we keep you alive between meals. We can show that again here, looking at our ATG7 knockout mice. So what you have here is the first three circle, circle, and the green triangle, all are sort of along this one top line up here. And these are mice, if you feed them, they're fine, right? So you don't necessarily need autophagy if you're fed. But if you take these, the red triangle mice, these are mice that have had the ATG7 removed, they cannot do autophagy and you fast them, you take away all their food, starting at about 16 hours, all of these mice start to die. Only about 20% of mice in these experiments that they do are surviving at 24 hours. Let's think about what happens um, in our infection control as well, because remember these guys up here are dying from infection. And what we have is different ways that the body is going to control infections. We have one that's just by phagocytosis. So we think of this as being um, involving macrophages, a type of white blood cell in the body. And what happens is, is out here, you have bacteria or um, different toxins, things that um, can hurt the cell or hurt the body. And they get re recognized by receptors. In this case, this is a toll-like receptor here. And there's also other receptors that can be involved, including these nod-like receptors. And so you can have a process called xenophagy, where the macrophage takes up these um, bacteria. The bacteria um, or other toxins are bound into an autophagosome, which then binds your lysosome and you break it up. And this is xenophagy, a direct killing of a bacteria or something toxic to the cell by autophagy. Uh, remember we talked about chaperone mediated autophagy. This is an example of that. So you have um, peptides in the body that work against um, different organisms and, and infections. And P62 is a chaperone protein, which will bring this antimicrobial peptide um, directly to the autophagolysosome. And this allows you to break off different pieces and then you can release the different pieces that are toxic to the bacteria. And then you can clear the pathogen from the cell. And then the third way that this can work is something called LC3 associated phagocytosis. And this is where LC3, which is required, remember, to bind our autophag or to produce our autophagosome. So you use this LC3 to help bind a membrane and then facilitate um, the uh, phagosome maturation. So you can see here, this LC3 makes this binds to the lysosome. You get your phagolysosome here. And then again, you lead to pathogen clearance. So just in this one cell, autophagy is really important and that you really have three different ways that this cell can use autophagy, use macroautophagy or chaperone mediated autophagy in order to protect the body against infection. There's also this concept of MHC restricted antigen presentation. So this is, you know, this process here, phagocytosis is pretty random, right? They do have receptors, but they're, um, you know, not uh, involving other cells. With MHC, restricted antigen presentation, what you need is you need to get um, antigen loaded into these MHC molecules, which then can go to the cell membrane. And then that can sit on the cell membrane and it can actually just present this antigen to a CD4 cell, a killer T cell. And then that's what's gonna go off and kill the rest of the things in your body. So we know that approximately 10 to 25% of MHC class two is putting in peptides um, that were provided through autophagy to reach this MHC. Um, and we know that this happens again in sort of three different ways. We can think about it in three different ways, kind of like the macrophage had three different ways of doing it. We also have three different ways of processing these antigens in order to get them up to the top. So the first way is again, one of our chaperone mediated autophagy methods. In this case, we're using LAMP2A and HSC70, and you're binding these together in order to take some kind of um, 
antigen. So this is floating around in the cell. This is the antigen you want to get delivered. And so you use CMA to take up, you get the cytosol to break down stuff a little bit. Then you take up this um, portion here and you bring it into your lysosome to break it down into little pieces. These little pieces are then allowed to go to this MIIC, which is um, basically the machinery that takes proteins and, and loads them up into your um, MHC molecule. So you take these little pieces, you bring them to your machinery, you load them into a MHC molecule, and then you ship it up here to the top of the cell where CD4 cells can see this antigen and then go and protect your body. You can also do um, antigen fragments that connect with these mature endosomal or lysosomal compartments. That's the M MIIC again here. So you can have the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, which is um, going to take your MHC class two with your invariant genes. These are things that are needed to process the MHC two. They go through the ER, through the Golgi, then up here, and again, they're just meeting little proteins that happen to be in this um, mature compartment, the MIIC, and then is loaded up and goes to the cell. But then you can also have macroautophagy, which is involved. So you have an antigen or some kind of thing floating around the, the cell. It's taken up into an autophagosome. This lysosomal proteases break this down. So you take this, break it all down into little pieces. And then this autophagosome or autophagolysosome is actually providing the proteins into this MIIC or the machinery. And then you can take these little proteins, the orange and the greens, you can load them into your MHC and then present them to your T cell. So each of your cells in your body that's doing these autophagy allows you to either do sort of this generalized cleanup of things or a really focused, I want to kill a specific um, antigen, you know, COVID or whatever it is that you're trying to kill for the day. So you can see how it removes these intracellular pathogens. Um, we, you know, I mentioned this concept of fasting um, where aging um, has been shown, you can use autophagy to extend life in worms. We know that or other model organisms. So this is the concept of calorie restriction in people and why um, this concept of fasting has become so popular. Um, tumor suppression. We know that um, if we, we know that autophagy can be involved in tumor suppression, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. We know also that autophagy can be involved in tumor promotion um, where um, the cells are using it to progress and metastasize. And we know that we're able to regulate this for both protection and, and stimulation of cell death. So what if you're interested, now that I've fascinated with you with some of the things that autophagy can do um, in helping us survive, what are you going to do to identify it and measure it? So there's multiple different ways that you can do this. So the first way is sort of morphologic identification. This was what they used back in the 1960s. So remember I showed you a picture, um, electron microscopy type picture. And basically what you're looking at here is this is showing you the different stages of autophagy, but within this picture here. So what you can see is you have um, an autophagosome, right? Remember it's a double membrane vesicle. So here's your double membrane going around the whole cell and it contains different things. And you can see inside this double membrane vesicle, you've got all these different things here. And then you can also identify autophagosomes with um, degraded material inside. And so here you can see your double membrane again. This one's a little harder to see, but this one's really good. You can see your double membrane and it must have bound with the lysosome already because as opposed to here where you can see distinct organelles, you've got basically sort of a mushy soup of stuff that it's gonna um, give back to the cell so it can survive. So that's one way to do it. It's um, labor intensive and difficult and takes a lot of time and um, special microscopy and it's really, um, it's not very quantitative, it's, it's very qualitative in that you can measure and look at cells and you can have people count how many autophagosomes per cell and that kind of stuff. But you know, it's, it's really um, 
not as helpful, I don't think, when you're looking at autophagy. Instead, I think looking at really the proteins that are important in the cell um, and important in autophagy is, is the most helpful way, I think, to look at it. So here we're going to look at monitoring levels of things like LC3 and P62. So you can do your standard Western blot. It works really well. This is one of my pretty blots um, back in the day when I was pipetting a lot more. Um, and so what we have here is looking at um, SHRNA against HEG5. And you have um, two different cell lines, this is 794 and AM38. These are both, the Rs designate that these are cells, brain tumor cells that I made resistant to targeted therapy. And basically what you have is you can see that if I have the ATG, I'm able to see a protein called LC3. If I take away the ATG5, I remove or decrease the amount of ATG, or I'm sorry, I decrease the amount of LC3 that's in the cell. And why is that important, right? So remember that LC3 is involved in this ligation pathway. And when you build your autophagosome, you actually get LC3 on the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. And so when the lysosome binds to the autophagosome, any of the LC3 that's inside the cell is going to go away. So here, if I inhibit ATG5, the cell's not able to make all this LC3. And that's why you see the decrease here. The other way is you could do something with flow cytometry, or here you can use fluorescent microscopy as well with these type of cells. And with this concept, what you do is you take an LC3 and you bind um, something to it that would, um, in this case, let's say we're gonna bind uh, something green and something red, and you bind it to the LC3. And then when you go into the cell, the LC3 inside the cell is um, tagged with a different uh, color so that then when this, lysosome binds, it's going to take away the amount of um, fluorescent tagging you have because it's going to degrade the LC3 that's inside this autophagosome. And then you could look for whatever color it is that you're measuring, green or red. And you can actually have a much more quantitative measurement to say how much autophagy is happening within that cell. Here's a way that you can use fluorescent tagging um, with microscopy. So again, here's your electron microscopy. This is like a very close picture. This is a really beautiful autophagosome here. You can see this nice double membrane. You can see you've got little dots of endoplasmic reticulum. You've got some mitochondria in there. And it's a really easy way to look at the cell um, and very pretty. The other way is if you tag LC3, you can show diffuse spreading of cytoplasm under normal conditions, right? So LC3 is gonna just be sort of floating around the cell. But then if you stress the cell, um, and I apologize, I'll fix this before I send you guys the slides. I don't know why that looks like that. But if you stress the cell, remember the LC3 is now gonna, instead of being floating around, it's gonna be bound into specific autophagosomes. And that's what you can see here, these little dots. So you stress the cell and you create these little dots. And now what you can see is you can actually, um, sorry, I don't know why that did that. Um, what you can see is you can see all these little dots and these are all the autophagosomes that you um, have now created when you stress the cell. You're able to look at this a little bit more quantitatively as well because you can actually um, use uh, programs to count the number of dots that you have. It's a little less um, prone to human error. So how do we regulate this process? We do this through um, something called ATG genes. So ATG genes um, are vital in order for autophagy to continue, but it also is known that these do other things. So most of these were identified and characterized in yeast and then sort of transitioned over to what we know about what they do in humans. We know that there's more than 20 gene products that are required for autophagosome formation. And we know that some of these molecules are like ATG1 is a protein kinase, ATG12 is a ubiquitin-like molecule. ATG6 is a scaffolding protein, and that is in our PA3 kinase complex. Remember back at the very beginning, we had that PA3 kinase complex. And then we have other ones that are proteases that are actually gonna break up um, different things. And so 
we know that this is a process that's conserved as we go from yeast to higher organisms. And the reason that I'm excited about the process is many of these ATG molecules are potentially druggable or something that we can hit or target in order to control this process. So again, this is just another view of looking at um, our different forms of autophagy. This is our induction. This is our nucleation. This is our elongation. Um, and then this is our docking infusion. And then this is our breakdown. And so what you can see is that the, if we look, let's, for example, at the regulation of induction, we can use drugs like rapamycin, which we'll talk about a little bit more to control this process. We can look at things that'll block the isolation membrane. We can look at the PA3 kinase. Maybe there's something in here that we can block like BPS 34. Um, there is some um, work looking also at how we prevent um, the fusion um, and inhibiting this end stage of autophagy. So really the important point is just that it's a multi-step process, it's multiple proteins and multiple options for targeting. So this is a reference slide. This is not something that you guys have to um, remember or memorize. This is just to show you that these are the main ATGs that we're using within autophagy um, and gives you their function over here. So this table, um, again, remember there's over 20 that are required, but these are the key ones that we think about um, and particularly the ones that we think about when we're trying to think about inhibiting the process or, or inducing the process. So again, remember that all these ATGs are regulators in the cell that do things that are not necessarily related to autophagy. So if you're going to influence these genes, you have to think about what else you're doing to the cell. <clears throat> For example, ATG7 is an E1-like enzyme. <clears throat> and it's required for protein conjugation, um, but also regulates transcription factor P53. ATG12 is ubiquitin-like, and it is also regulates, helps regulate apoptosis. And Becklin-1, a scaffolding protein in that PA3 kinase active, um, uh, complex, also controls cytokinesis. So if you're going to inhibit or induce any of these, you need to remember what else you might be affecting. So what about autophagy and cell death? We know that autophagy um, is, re is related to the other processes of cell death. We know that it's associated with necroptosis and we know that it's associated with apoptosis. And this again is not something that you are here to remember, but really it's just to show you if we take autophagy down here, we take apoptosis up here, and then we start to draw lines of where everything is connected or potentially interacting. Um, what you can see is, remember Becklin is up here, Becklin's down here. P53 is up here, P53 is affected down here. Caspase is up here. All of these things, you know, P62 up here, P62 down here. All of these things are really intertwined and interacted. So um, it's more complex than I think we truly still understand. Um, but it is important to know that you're influencing one process of cell death, you're going to be influencing the others. So here's just one example, a more detailed example of that, of how apoptosis regulates autophagy. So autophagy can regulate apoptosis and apoptosis can regulate autophagy. And that is through the cleavage of Becklin. So Becklin-1 is bound to BCL2, which is a BH3 protein. So if you inhibit this interaction, you release Becklin. Becklin then can bind to VPS 34. VPS 34 can then roll down into here, into your complex and help with induction of autophagy. As autophagy is um, moving forward, you actually have autophagy affecting other genes and other proteins. These proteins typically are down here. So for example, FOXO3 that's um, regulating autophagy. So if you break down FOXO3 or other proteins, you reduce the amount of both autophagy regulation and apoptosis regulation. And for example, if you break down this protein, you increase your autophagy, you lose this apoptosis gene controlling protein. It can then produce um, BH3 proteins like Puma, 
which then can go up here to allow BCL2 to separate from Bax and Bax. And then your Bax and Bax can then roll to your mitochondria, producing apoptotic cell death. So just here in just BCL2 and Becklin, you have um, the interaction between the two processes and a nice review of apoptosis. So this is why um, it's really difficult to work out what autophagy is doing versus the other proteins, right? So this is just looking again, this is your Becklin, you've got your BH3, your BCL2 and BCLXL that bind here to BPS34. And if this is bound, the BCL2, BCLXL is bound, you're not gonna have autophagy that's blocking that system. But if you have some sort of other BH3 protein that comes in, which is now binding your BCL2, that's gonna allow this to separate. And then this whole um, complex is able to activate. And the reason that this is really important is because we know that we have drugs that can um, target the BH3 domain. And we know that these drugs induce apoptosis and increase autophagy at the same time. So a BH3 mimetic, which is the, the kind of um, drug that can control this system. Um, there was one ABT737, also known as venetoclax. And we know that venetoclax um, disrupts this BCL1 Becklin, or I'm sorry, this Becklin1 BCL um, interaction. So we know that this venetoclax can come here and, and break up this connection. And this drug was approved in 2016 to treat chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It was actually fast-tracked through the system and it's incredibly popular right now. So just this morning, I looked up on clinicaltrials.gov um, to see how many clinical trials are assessing venetoclax in the use of just any disease whatsoever. And there were 202 clinical trials that were actively recruiting to study venetoclax. 14 of those were pediatric, which is actually pretty good um, to have a pediatric representation. And so, you know, these drugs that we're using that we think we're interacting with, um, for example, venetoclax, we think all we're doing is really driving these cells to apoptosis by releasing things like BCL2 and allowing it to, um, I'm sorry, to binding these things to allowing Bax and Bax to release. We're really, we think we're inducing apoptosis, but we're also inhibiting or involving autophagy at the same time. And that's something that I'm particularly interested in. There's the question of whether or not autophagy actually kills cells. Um, and this has been a hotly debated subject. Um, and we'll go over a little bit here why we think that is. So here is an example of apoptosis, right? So you have this poor little cell, he's like blebbing off, um, trying to die. And here is a cell with, um, large amounts of autophagy. So the question is, is, is all this autophagy within the cell going to kill the cell? And we know that these anti we know that all of these agents that are listed here induce autophagy or increase the amount of autophagy that the cell's having. And it's been proposed that these um, treatments are causing cell death by actually the amount of autophagy they're inducing. But let's think about that, right? So here we're gonna use cancer as, a, as an option. So we take cancer cells and we treat them with some kind of drug or radiation or some other stimulus. And then the cells are going through their process and right here, autophagy happens, right? And then the cells die. So did autophagy happen and that's what killed the cells or was autophagy happening anyway because it was trying to save itself using its recycling process to give it things that it could do to save whatever cancer treatment it has. So that's why it's really hard to say whether or not autophagy is happening and you just happen to catch it at the same time or it's actually what is then tipping that cell over to death. We know that knockdown of autophagy genes can prevent cell death. So here, what we're looking at is colony numbers here on the y-axis. And then we've got three different treatment groups. We've got um, our baseline control group. And then we've got an atopicide chemotherapy treatment group and a sterosporine um, therapy group. 
And what you're doing is looking at siRNA against BAX, BAC, right? So BAX and BEC, these are things that are associated in apoptosis. And then APG5, or in humans, it would be ATG5. So if you knock these genes down and you treat a cancer cell with a toposide, um, you can see that BAX and BEC, which are associated with the, um, the apoptosis pathway and ATG5, that you're decreasing, I'm sorry, this is Becklin one. I apologize, Bax, Becklin one and HG5. So if you decrease the autophagy genes, the um, Becklin and the ATG5, the cells are able to survive more after chemotherapy. So in this case, decreasing autophagy actually helped the cells survive. So you could say, well, I took the autophagy away, therefore it must have been helping the cell die. And when we think about what people call autophagic cell death, you know, it's associated with the formation of these vesicles. We I just showed you that if you inhibit the autophagic machinery in some cases, like Becklin or other ATG cells, it actually allows the continued growth of the cell. Um, it can occur in cells when cells aren't able to perform apoptosis. And so the question is, would the cells prefer to die by apoptosis if they could, but the only reason they're using autophagy is because they can't perform apoptosis. But again, there's not a lot of clear evidence that there's true cell death by autophagy. There was a study in 2013 that identified something called autosis as a form of death, and this used a sodium potassium ATPase. And what it claimed is that cerebral hypoxia um, and ischemia involved this process and that um, neuron cell death happened by this autosis, but um, really there's not been a whole lot of further evidence of these things. So we will leave it in the air as to whether or not apoptosis can, or autophagy can actually cause cell death. Really the most important thing we think about is inhibition of cell death by autophagy, right? So autophagy is a survival mechanism. And let's take camper, I'm sorry, cancer as an example. So autophagy can protect against apoptosis and cell death. It can either suppress a tumor or it can actually help a tumor grow. So when a tumor is growing, autophagy can be protective, right? So it can protect the cell during oxygen and nutrient deprivation. So think of a solid tumor and the cells deep in the middle of the tumor, they don't get a lot of oxygen. They don't get a lot of nutrients. How are they going to survive? I already showed you how autophagy can help um, promote or prevent apoptosis. In this case, it would be preventing. And then if I treat this tumor with radiation or chemo, protective autophagy would help that cell survive again. Remember that autophagy happens in order to try and help the cell um, prevent death. So you have some protective autophagy, which is actually promoting growth of cells. In this case, we're looking at a tumor cell cytotoxic autophagy, right? So it can actually be resulted in tumor suppression. So um, as the cell is growing, autophagy is breaking down toxic things like mitochondria that have um, poor quality. Maybe that physiologic um, autophagic cell death. You can use chemotherapy and radiation in this case to potentially induce that autophagic cell death. You can use that autophagic machinery in order to break up those proteins and present them from MHCs to your CD4 killer cells to provide potentially tumor immunity. And then you can also use autophagy to inhibit angiogenesis or prevent those tumor cells from building new blood cells in order to get new oxygen. And this is all a balance in life. There's these things are going on all the time. And really what you're trying to do is either create a balance or flip this balance so that the tumor growth goes down and the tumor suppression goes up. We know that autophagy is sort of a saving grace if you lose something that you really need. So if you took IL-3 dependent cells and then you remove the IL-3 from the cells, they will activate autophagy. And it's the autophagy that allows those cells to survive. If you block autophagy and take away this IL-3, if the cells are dependent, you get more rapid cell death by apoptosis because you no longer have autophagy in order to protect the cell. 
So I was talking about how autophagy can selectively promote or inhibit apoptosis in the same cells. And again, it all goes back to sort of that teeter-totter, that balance that we're trying to create. And how are we going to measure how much this is? So again, this is looking at, remember I talked about if you could tag an LC3, in this case, we're tagging it green and red. So when you create a autophagosome, it's going to be with two colors. Then you can sort this so that you know that if um, in this case, this m cherry LC3 construct, the GFP is quenched when it sees um, a low pH. And so the lysosome um, takes away your GFP, meaning that cells that have a lot of red have had more autophagy than cells that have yellow, which is your red-green combination. So you can actually flow sort these. You can look at the cells that have low flux. You can look at the cells that have high flux. And what you can see here is if you have low flux cells and high flux cells, you sort them, you have high autophagy cells in the top 30%. And in the low bottom, you, you would take the other 30% and you treat them with um, fast ligand or trail. You can see what happens is the difference in viability. So if you have a cell that has um, high flux or low flux and you treat them with um, fast ligand or trail, you can see that fast ligand cells, the low flux cells are better able to survive. And in the trail treated cells, the high flux autophagy cells are better able to survive. So variation in autophagy in the cell is gonna help in this case determine how the cells live or die. But the kind of stimulus that you gave the cell is gonna be important, right? So fast ligand cells did well under low flux conditions, but trail cells did better with a high flux condition. So how much autophagy a cell is able to do is going to depend, is going to make it survive differently based on the conditions that it's under. So again, we're thinking about this teeter-totter sort of concept, right? And we know that autophagy is going to stimulate or inhibit apoptosis, again, by deg degradation of different proteins. So if you have low autophagy, we looked at this a little bit before, you get increase of proteins like Puma, which is then allowed to go through and you can get this really rap rapid, um, fast death. Or if you have decreased amounts of, of Puma because you have high autophagy, so you're breaking down this protein, you don't have as much of this protein which allows inefficient mom, slow death, and even the potential of recovery. So think about this homeostatic sort of basal rate that the cells are having. And you need this homeostasis in order to balance out your scales, right? And so what happens is, is if I block autophagy, I'm no longer breaking down different proteins that are regulating genes. These proteins are then released to the cell in order to produce new apoptosis or new autophagy regulating genes, which then are allowed to go back and rebalance what we're trying to maintain in the cell. And let's think about this in sort of a cancer setting. Again, I keep going back to cancer because that's what I do, but I think it's really important. It's a great model in order to see what we're trying to think about. So if we don't inhibit autophagy, we just let it go through its life and do what it's going to do. It takes, for example, this FOXO3A protein and it degrades it. And therefore the tumor has low apoptosis sensitivity, right? So only the cells that are green or brown are going to be um, sensitive to apoptosis. If you inhibit autophagy, you can prevent the breakdown of proteins like FOXO3. FOXO3 can then go to the nucleus and produce protein formation of Puma, which then sensitizes the cell to apoptosis. And then when you treat them, more of your cancer cells will die. And this is this concept, right, of just this edge. We really want to just push these cancer cells over their apoptotic threshold so that they die. And our goal is to use autophagy to flip this 
balance from anti-apoptotic to pro-apoptotic. We're priming the cells, we're using autophagy to prime these cells, and then we're using our therapies to push these cells over the edge so that they die. So again, many different ways that we can positively and negatively manipulate this. And first thing that we're gonna talk about is how we protect um, with autophagy. So autophagy prides, provides protection against our aggregate prone proteins. So these are proteins that are going to go from a monomer to a dimer, then you get an oligomer, and then all of a sudden these oligomers come together and you get this protein aggregate. And if you let these protein aggregates sit around in two, um, cells like your brain, you can get different proteins like amyloid B, tau proteins, um, SOD1, all of these things have been found that they build up and they create diseases like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, Huntington's disease, right? So all of these proteins aggregate together, they build up in these poor neurons and the neurons start to die or not function. So what are we gonna do about that? So here, we're gonna look at the mTOR pathway, right? So we think about mTOR up here and we can see that mTOR is inhibiting our OK1 complex. So if we take a drug and we inhibit mTOR, we're going to release control of our OK1 complex, and that's going to allow more autophagy to happen. So drugs that can inhibit mTOR include rapamycin and everolimus. These are drugs that have been around a long time um, and are actively used. Rapamycin is used predominantly in patients who require some sort of immunosuppression as well. But everolimus has been used to treat different tumors. It's also been shown to treat um, seizures um, in certain patients or kids who have um, something called tuber sclerosis complex or TSC. And so we know that we can use this, um, these mTOR drugs in order to induce autophagy. And we know that this protects against toxicity in the neurons. So what they did here is they took flies and they gave them um, something called Q108 um, proteins. And we know that these long polyglutamines within the fly will aggregate in the neurons and these flies will have an early death. So when they look at the adult flies and they say, okay, how many of you flies contain this Q108 construct after you've grown up? If we look at our control, only about you know, six, 7% of these flies had the Q108. But if we treated them with rapamycin, you had an increase of a, up to 15% of adult flies that would be able to survive this aggregation um, process because you have induced autophagy within these flies and allowed them to get rid of some of that polyglutamate um, aggregate and therefore survive to adulthood. And we know that this is important, particularly for aggregation, because if you do the same thing in flies, but you use a Q22 or a really short polyglutamine, it's not going to aggregate. And then you treat them with rapamycin. Not only do the, do the flies, most of the flies live um, to adulthood with this transgene, but the rapamycin doesn't really change anything. So that's how we know that it's involved in proteins that are going to aggregate. And how do we know this specifically is a, um, due to autophagy? So here we're going to look at um, flies again. We're looking at whether or not they had abnormal eyes or did they have toxicity associated with their eyes? And what we're looking at here is um, whether or not flies carry this ATG1 or able to undergo autophagy. So you have no rapamycin treatment and good autophagy and no rapamycin treatment and bad autophagy. And then if you treat, they had, and these patients all have about the same, or I'm sorry, patients, ha, little tiny flies. Um, they have um, abnormal eyes and that's about the same. If you treat with rapamycin um, and you can undergo autophagy, you can see that it takes from maybe one abnormality per count and then drops that in half. So you're able to allow these flies to have better eyeballs. If you take away autophagy, so you can't induce it, right? So here you're inducing autophagy, reducing the effect. If you take away autophagy in a, in a, or you induce autophagy in a fly that can't do autophagy, it's the same. It doesn't really matter. 
So based on this, we know that autophagy for protection against neurodegeneration is really important. So again, we have all of those aggregate prone proteins that can cause diseases like Huntington's and Alzheimer's. We know that these proteins are cleared by autophagy, so we can use autophagy to take away that toxic insult to the neuron. We know that if we inhibit this process, that clearance of these aggregate proteins is gonna be delayed. But if you increase autophagy, again, with drugs like everolimus or rapamycin, you can protect against cell death. And in vivo, we've shown in flies and mouse models, you can protect against tissue damage. And so the use of rapamycin its derivatives of Rolimus can be used as autophagy inducers as either um, chemo prevention or a treatment against these neurogenerative diseases. And so there are studies ongoing to see how we can affect this. Um, but again, think about all these other drugs we know out there that we're using that inhibit autophagy and whether or not they're increasing the concerns for this neurodegenerative problem. So we're gonna walk through on how you might consider doing this in a clinical trial, because I'm not sure what you all wanna study, but eventually I would hope that whatever you're studying, no matter how basic it is, you eventually wanna try and improve not only the understanding of science, but the understanding of the world, right? And in this case, we're gonna understand the world of humans and their disease. And so this is just an example. Um, you could go to this website if you want on your own time. But if we looked at this clinical trial, called a double-blind placebo-controlled trial of anti-aging, okay? So what they're doing is they're using a medicine called metformin, and they say, we're going to look at metformin in adults with prediabetes and show whether or not, because we induce autophagy with this drug, do we prevent aging? And this is a real trial, I didn't make it up. Um, and so if we look at this trial, how are they altering autophagy, right? They're using metformin, to induce autophagy. So kind of like the everolimus and the rapamycin, they're gonna induce autophagy. How are they clinically monitoring autophagy? They're gonna look at LC3. That's a member, that's one of those proteins. And they're gonna look at it in leukocytes. And what do they think their treatment's going to do? They think that inducing autophagy is gonna reduce inflammation, reduce muscle and tendon degeneration, and have an anti-cancer effect, and preserve cardiac function and prevent age-associated dementia. So this is a trial that's actually enrolling and ongoing. But what about other diseases? When I looked um, again today on clinicaltrial.gov, there's 62 trials that you can find that are actively enrolling with the concept of autophagy. There's a few of them that are studying things like muscle wasting or myopathy, but the majority are cancer trials using drugs like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine to inhibit autophagy in combination with other anti-cancer drugs. So this is where we're thinking of in this process, right? So chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, they block fusion of the autophagosome um, and the lysosome here. So this uses snare proteins like STS-6. And if you inhibit this fusion that prevents the breakdown of the contents of the, the vesicles, and therefore it's unable to complete this process, and release the nutrients and proteins back to the cell. And we know that we have done a ton of deliberate autophagy inhibition in cancer patients. Um, and most of these trials are sort of all comers and they use hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine, which are both FDA approved in order to inhibit autophagy. I guess you don't care about the FDA because you're in Brazil, but you also probably can get chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And so this is some of um, just really quickly, some of my work. And so this was looking at a patient that was diagnosed with a tumor treated with radiation, had a recurrence, um, was determined to have a BRAF V600E mutation, which we know we can treat with targeted therapy with drugs like vemurafenib. After about 11 months of treatment with vemurafenib, the patient recurred and we started treatment with a combination of vemurafenib plus chloroquine. And this is an MRI picture. And what you can see here is this is the brainstem. This is sort of a diffuse tumor within the brainstem. You can't remove it with surgery. And at this time, she had another little area up here that was felt to be metastatic disease. So we started treatment here with the autophagy inhibitor and the um, vemurafenib. And after um, six weeks, there was clinical improvement. And after two months, what you can see is this 
tumor here in the primary brainstem is getting smaller and this metastatic disease area is gone. So what you can see is that, you know, this patient who's sort of gone on and off, this was a picture done in an article from 2014, but this patient is still alive with this tumor that's sitting here in the middle of her brainstem. This is another patient looking at, can we use um, autophagy inhibition um, to control disease? So this is a, we're just gonna focus on this tumor site up here. This patient actually has lots of tumor all over, but we'll look at this little spot here. So this is baseline. This tumor had also a BRAF mutation. And so we used a BRAF inhibitor and unfortunately it didn't work. We tried another inhibitor down the pathway to see if we could get that to work. Um, a MEK inhibitor, and in this case, you can see that this bright tumor continues to grow. So we went back and we did a, the BRAF inhibitor and the autophagy inhibitor, and again, you can see where we take this very large tumor and make it a little bit smaller. And we know that these cells are dying, so these, these is a in vitro assay looking at this particular patient's cells that we were able to grow in the lab. And what you can see is that if we treat with vimurafenib, um, which is the RAF inhibitor drug, we increased phospho -ERK. And so this drug really should decrease phospho -ERK. And so when we look at the addition of chloroquine and LDH release or something that would indicate cell death, what you can see is that when you treat with just the vimurafenib or the RAF inhibitor, it doesn't do very much. You treat with chloroquine, it does a little bit. If you combine these two together, you get this dramatic increase in LDH release and therefore a dramatic increase in cell death. So we know we can show this here in our patient sample in the lab, and we can actually treat the patient. And this patient um, unfortunately has passed away since that time, but had a tumor that typically has a survival of approximately nine to 12 months. And she lived about eight years with her tumor. So that's a really dramatic increase in survival and something I think is important to think about. So what about this? If we're thinking about inhibiting autophagy, we wanna kill cells, how are we gonna do this? So again, you can go later on to look at the actual clinical trial. But if we look at the addition of chloroquine to chemo radiation for glioblastoma, so in these trials, they're using chloroquine to inhibit autophagy. And if you think about it, radiation and temozolomide we already looked at can actually induce autophagy. So you're increasing autophagy within the cell, you're increasing the, induct or the initiation of autophagy, but you're preventing it from completing the process. They're gonna monitor it through LC3 and autophagic vesicle changes and leukocytes. Again, this is important to use the proteins that's going through autophagy in order to measure it. And this is, in this case was a dose finding study to show how chloroquine blocking autophagy during radiation and temozolomide will kill more tumor cells and increase survival. So one thing I didn't add here, and I apologize, I just didn't have the time, but this is very similar to a study that we're doing based on this research, this data. So we have a study looking at these RAF pathway in, um, inhibitors plus autophagy inhibitors in pediatric tumors, uh, pediatric brain tumors. So it's all pretty exciting and it sort of has the same concept. So really, if we think about it, what are we, what's the summary of sort of all this stuff that we talked about? So autophagy is regulated, highly regulated, involves a lot of these ATG genes and proteins. It's important in many different processes, both physiological to maintain us to be healthy and pathologic processes. It is intimately associated with other cell death pathways like apoptosis and necroptosis. We know it can protect us against nutrient deprivation and do stress, neurodegeneration, um, and anti-cancer agents. We're still trying to figure out how we figure out which response occurs to these, um, these protection and, and inhibition things. We know we can manipulate the pathway, um, but really the main question for a lot of things is what, how do we do it? And in what direction should we send the pathway? Should we increase it or should we decrease it? And we often are inadvertently manipulating autophagy using drugs for other purposes. So again, looking at Everolimus for some kind of tumor or rapamycin for um, immune suppression, you know, we're manipulating autophagy and most of the time we don't think about it. So what about those learning objectives that I presented in the beginning? So let's look at that. So let's understand the difference between the two main types of 
macroautophagy and chaperone mediated autophagy. So again, chaperone mediated uses this amino acid sequence, this KFERQ sequence, which is going to take specific proteins, bind them, and deliver them to the lysosome. Macroautophagy is more just sort of giving a hug around all its cytoplasm and taking away whatever it, whatever it picks up, fuses with the lysosome, and then degrades. So that's the pretty basic concept there. The process of macroautophagy, so this is a very simple way to think about it. You have all of the pictures in the beginning of the lecture and throughout to show you the really complicated method, but this is the simple way to think about it. We activate a PA3 complex that allows nucleation of the membrane. We regulate protein conjugation events to extend that membrane and make it longer. We randomly capture, or you can specifically deliver cargo to this extending membrane. And then this membrane closes up into a double membrane vesicle, fuses with the lysosome, and then you get all your recycling of your amino acids and your other um, macro macromolecular precursors. We want to think about autophagy treating diseases. We think about the aggregate prone protein diseases that cause, remember those proteins build up in neurons and it's caused cell death. And we know that autophagy is degrading these proteins and that allows toxic stimulus to be removed and the neuron to survive. And then understanding how autophagy can be altered to treat diseases. This is sort of the, um, this is going to be the, well, let me stop here for a second and see if anybody has any questions. And then I have um, a couple of sort of cases we can think about and how are we gonna change autophagy in order to treat the diseases? Well, all right, guys, anybody has questions? I, I have a bunch, Jean, but uh, I'd rather wait the, the students. Any one of you guys want to ask a question? Samson, can you turn your mic on and, and ask directly to Jean, please? Okay, okay, thank you very much, Professor Jean. A lot of okay, thank you very much, Professor Jean, for the wonderful lecture. I actually learned a lot from this. Actually, <laughs> so my question is about um, we talked about autophagy and apoptosis, kind of cell death. So, in one of the slides, you mentioned you showed us so you, you it's like you treated a patient with brain tumor with um, BRAF in vitro and mm -hmm. uh, make in vitro. And later on in the um, Western blood analysis that you should decide it, I saw something like LDH. Mm -hmm. You mentioned LDH release. So I was wondering that, because I know LDH release to be associated with lytic kind of cell death. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there is any relationship between autophagy and other types of cell death. I mean, lytic types of cell death like um, pyroptosis or necroptosis. Have you checked this before? Because I actually don't know. Yeah, thank so, yeah, thank you. So I'm, this is a pretty sure the slide that you're referring to, which is showing the release of LDH to, as a measure of cell death within the cells. And, you know, it's kind of funny because one of the things that we're studying right now is, um, remember we talked about venetoclax and how it can push something towards this apoptotic edge. So one of the theories that I have is that these cells are, by blocking autophagy, we're pushing them a little further towards their apoptotic threshold. And then we know that these RAF inhibitors, a lot of times are, are causing more senescence than they're causing cell death. And so the goal would be to see how we use this inhibition of autophagy to push the cells towards their apoptotic threshold the RAF inhibitor to prevent the cell from growing. But based on my studies, the autophagy inhibitor and the RAF inhibitor itself are not enough to get it to go through, like really push these cells to apoptosis. So now what we're looking at is the use of BH3 mimetics or the venetoclax sort of concept. And if you combine those together, right? So you combine a RAF inhibitor to prevent the cell from growing, you prove of, do apoptosis, I'm sorry, autophagy inhibition to prevent recycling pushing that cell towards a threshold, and then you give it a BH3 mimetic, which will then 
push it completely over the edge. So now the cell can't grow, the cell can't recycle, and you push the cell to death. So that would be sort of my ultimate goal that I'm working on right now. Um, but just autophagy inhibition in these particular cells and the RAF inhibition aren't quite enough to get it to go to apoptosis. Does that answer your question? Oh, yes. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for that. All right, thank you, Samson. Uh, I think uh, we have a couple of more questions. Michelle, I think this, you are on my first on my list. Would you like to turn um, on the? Okay, go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you, Jean, for your lecture. It was really enlightening. My question is about the inhibition of autophagy. Uh, you said that if you do this in, in a cancer, in a tumor, it would uh, reduce the tumor. But uh, if you inhibit autophagy in a, context, in a context of cancer, you would be inhibiting in another kind of cells uh, in the body too. For example, in the context of uh, muscle wasting, uh, we have autophagy happening in the fibers of the muscle. And I would like to understand better if, uh, um, if it works the cell to survive or, um, or if it uh, leads to a cell death too, because autophagy in the first time, uh, um, it should be protecting the cell because of the starvation and everything. Mm -hmm. But in the end, uh, we prevent the muscle to recover. So uh, do you know something about that to explain it there? Thank you. Yeah, so one of the things that you wanna think about is where are you inhibiting autophagy and how well are you inhibiting autophagy? So for example, if you look at this pathway, right, you can, in, you can inhibit up here with ulk one you can inhibit here with VPS 34, you can inhibit here. So really what, one of the things that we're still studying is where is the best place to inhibit autophagy to get the process that you want. The other thing is how well are you inhibiting autophagy? Chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine are okay at inhibiting autophagy but I don't think that they have complete inhibition. So for example, in the cells that I work with, I think about things being autophagy addicted, cells that have to have autophagy to survive. And so in cells that have MAP kinase pathway alterations, like these brain tumors I work with, or um, uh, not uh, pancreatic cancer or other um, MAP kinase activated cancers, we know that these cells really have to have autophagy to survive. If you take their autophagy away, these cells just die off. There's other brain tumors that I've worked with that I did work for like 18 months in the lab. It was so depressing. I'll tell you guys my story. I went into the lab. I started studying autophagy. I thought, well, I'm just going to change. I'm going to alter this and inhibit this in, in these brain tumor cells. And I'm going to cure cancer. And for the first 18 months with the tumors I was working with, medulloblastoma, ATRT, I inhibited the daylights out of them. I used drugs, I used genetics, I did everything. These cells didn't care. They could survive very well without very much autophagy. They had other systems to help them survive. So it wasn't until I was able to identify a marker of autophagy addiction, or in this case, these MAP kinase pathway altered tumors that really require autophagy to survive. So if I take chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, which work okay, but aren't fantastic, and I put them into a, a tumor or a person, I'm going to inhibit autophagy in these addicted cells and they're going to die off. But because my autophagy inhibition isn't very good, it's going to allow these other cells that need autophagy to survive to go on and continue. Because if I gave a person something that completely blocked autophagy, think what would happen to their neurons, right? Their brain would start to build up protein aggregates and they would die. So you have to think about how well you're inhibiting the process and how, and what method you're using to inhibit. The other thing that I didn't show you guys data for this because we just didn't have enough time or I didn't think I had enough time. Um, plus I don't want to bore you guys, um, is this concept of, um, where in the process you're inhibiting. So I've done some studies that show that BPS 34 and ALK1 inhibition isn't any better than late stage inhibition with 
um, by inhibiting back here. Right. So at least in this, in the disease process that I work in, it doesn't seem to matter where in the process I inhibit. I just need to inhibit it. There's other things that maybe they need to inhibit it, you know, further up, or they need to inhibit it somewhere in the middle. And those are all the things that are being studied. So for your question, which is if I inhibit it in a tumor, but I also have muscle wasting, you know, and I want autophagy to inhibit in the tumor, but not necessarily in the muscle. I want to use something that maybe doesn't inhibit very well in a, tum in a tumor cell that's really addicted to it. That way I can block and kill this tumor, but not affect the other process. That makes sense? Yes, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Jean, can also you use it approaches to deliver locally? Uh, you mm -hmm. know your drug instead of uh, you know systemically. That that does that help? Yeah, I haven't actually done that. I mean, there are ways that you can do that. There's um, you know you can use uh, delivery um, like targeted delivery systems. You can use. Um, uh, convection enhanced sort of delivery where you put sort of lines into specific areas of a tumor or wherever you want to get it and, and deliver the drug. Um, I don't think that there's been a lot of investigation of using that method in autophagy inhibition of, the, of, of late. Most of the research has been looking at um, improving this, like improving um, taking chloroquine and making dimers of it and making lyso 5 or these other new drugs that would be better at inhibiting late stage or specifically looking at drugs that are VPS 34 ULK1 inhibitors. There's a VPS 34 inhibitor that um, I'm, I was working with that got sold to a drug company they're trying to develop. So most of the most of it has been looking at altering these pathways. All right, let, let me just throw uh, one, one question just to follow up this before I, I, I ask Gabriela and Gustavo to questions when you look at the you show the the results on the ATG7 knockout mm -hmm. mice that only like around 20 percent survive fasting so is this uh i understand that this is a total every cell deficient so is an ATG7 completely deficient mice mm -hmm. the question is that is so the the sensitivity of, of the lack of autophagy is equal, or is there any particular cells that are suffering and causing the death during the starvation? Or is it a general thing? It's typically a general thing. And the reason that you get these 20% of mice that are able to survive is that those mice we're able to upregulate some other system to provide them energy. So remember that if you just take out ATG7, that this is a complex that uses multiple different proteins. And I can take a cell, an autophagy addicted cell, and I can remove its AT, I can remove an ATG, I can completely crisper it out so it doesn't have anything. And I know this shell should die, and somehow a cell survives. So there's something happening within these cells or these mice or something that's that is changing in order to provide that energy. Um, this experiment didn't actually go into that to look and see what it is like the mice survivors, you know, what it is, what is it about these little mice that survived that allowed them to produce energy? What system did they use? So they didn't go into that very much, but there are other ways to get around this, either altering or replacing this HEG7 with something else that can do something similar. So you get just enough autophagy in order to get the nutrients or some other some other process within cell that was able to provide energy. So, but you think it's, uh, you know, I don't know if the, the you know, the, the authors went on to find out, but uh, is it like a shutdown of the muscle cells? Then is it the, the oh, heart why they stop die? beating? Yeah, oh. or the brain stop, uh, you know, transmitting signal? Oh, right, right, or is right. it uh, like respiratory, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um... Or, Boy, I should remember that because I've read this paper multiple times. I would have to go back to the paper and actually double check. My guess would be, right, if you, um, 
if you are unable to produce energy and balance your energy levels, it's typically a, a brain problem because your brain is so dependent on glucose and those kind of things. And so if you think about a patient who think about a diabetic patient who loses their ability to have, like their, they take too much insulin and their glucose goes down, their problem becomes seizure and neurologic. So that would be my guess, but I'd actually have to go back to the paper and check. I apologize. I don't know that. No, no, that's great. Just, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot. That's a lesson for the students is don't ever BS your way through something. Admit if you don't know it. Uh, Gabriela. Hi, Professor. Uh, it was excellent your, your lecture because for me, it's a totally co uh, complex uh, subject because I uh, my research is inflammation, chronic inflammation. Ah. And one of my questions was similar with Michelle, if, if thinking of uh, muscular uh, depletion anyway. But uh, thinking of chronic inflammation, what kind of mechanisms we could we could see that I don't know interleukins because uh, if for acute inflammation we we will have a different response of autophagy. I don't know. I don't know or chronic. I, I don't know. Right. I want to show you something. This is from another talk, but and I know I'm not going over this for you guys, but I want to show you something. Um, so if you look at this. Necroptosis. Because even if you 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 say that you work with we do research with, with diabetic patients too, and is is a chronic disease now that a, a lot of peroxidation. I don't know if, if mm -hmm. did, we can modulate this. Yeah, and and we know that um, well, you know we know that this concept. I was looking for um, where is it? It's not showing it. Um, Sorry, I was looking, I thought I had a, a specific slide in here, but right. So if you're working with inflammation, right. Um, mm -hmm. we know that autophagy and things like necroptosis are involved. And we know that necroptosis yes. is associated with, um, inflammation. And we know that, um, this is just looking at I'm trying to find the combination one that I had. It's not there. Okay. Um, so we know that, that these processes are all related. Um, there was a paper that just came out in, um, tw just a couple months ago that was looking at, um, autophagy and inflammation and how these things are involved. And one of the things that they looked at was this fusion state. And if you remember the, um, oh, here it is. Um, so this paper that just came out, um, which looked at TNF induced necroptosis and how it is involved in early, it initiates early autophagy events. So it makes it want to start and it works through root kinase, but then it inhibits late autophagy. And so we know that if it's inhibiting late autophagy, it's working through these things called snare proteins. And we know that it's, um, these snare proteins are important for the combination or the binding of the lysosome to the autophagosome. And in this paper, what they showed was that necroptosis was resulting in, in, um, breakdown of the like STX 17 and therefore presenting, preventing this combination, but then also allowing the increase in the beginning. So we know that, that, you know, TNF and necrosis and inflammation, all those kind of things are going to be involved. And one of the things that the body is going to try and do is autophagy in order to protect from the inflammation. And then the necroptosis is turning around and saying, well, I don't want that protection. I want the cell to die, or I want this inflammation. And then it's actually breaking down the things that the protein, the proteins that the autophagosome needs to bind to the lysosome. Mm -hmm. So how is inhibiting autophagy in your process going to affect the process? you'd have to see, you'd have to double check. And I, I mean, honestly, um, mm -hmm. I haven't done that particular experiment, but you would have to look and see, and you would have to say how much autophagy inhibition, you know, if I completely take it away, what does it do? If I CRISPR something out of the cell, it can't do autophagy at all versus if I just inhibit it pharmacologically, 
And there's no pharmacologic drug out there we know that can inhibit it completely. Mm -hmm. So that's where you're trying to find the balance, right? Where you can inhibit the system where you want to inhibit it as much as you want to inhibit it while not influencing these other processes that you're dealing with. Okay. Very complicated. It's all the teeter totter. Yes. It's all about the balance of where you are, mm -hmm. um, which makes it a pain in the butt when you're trying to use it in research, just putting that out there. <laughs> <laughs> we have to control a lot of mechanisms. In the yeah. And, 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 and that remember was why studying things, right. You start within, you know, you can go back. I was talking to someone the other day who's got an autopsy interest and in, they're not even working in cells. They were just working in like crystallized protein. Mm -hmm. But from that crystallized protein, I could be like, ah, eventually we can get it over here. So you go from your crystallized protein, you work with it within your cell, but eventually these processes are so intertwined. You have to put them into some sort of in vivo system in order to understand how it's interacting and what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so professor. You already, hopefully you already work in mice or something like that to work in your process. Sorry? Do you work with, with animal models? Yes, I work with mice and uh, I generate um, um, muscle lesion in this, in this, in this mice, in this mice. So I supplemented with uh, any trace um, uh, omega trace fat acids mm -hmm. to recover this inflammation. Good. And, and we see necrosis, fibrosis, all this process. And if you, we could include just to try to see autophagy was, it would be so nice, but I don't know how to do this. Yeah. I mean, if you really have an interest in, in looking at some of that, just email me and I can connect with you and, and, and show you and teach you how to do those things. Oh, thank you, professor. Yeah. yeah. Just email me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Right, after you, actually. after, after class, you, you put your email in the chat. So uh, yeah, I'll put yeah, my well, I, 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 Yeah, I think it's best. I, I have it anyway, if you guys, you know, need it. Yeah, definitely. Gustavo. Gustavo. Thank you. I, I, are you listening to me now? Yes, we can yes, hear you. Yes, yes. Right. So thank you, professor, for the astonishing presentation the lecture it was really 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 good <laughs> thank you very much for yeah. explaining this topic for us and i originally had two questions and i believe the first one was really similar to michelle and gabriella mm -hmm. and it was about the effect of inhibition in inhibiting pharmacologically the autophagy and how it could implicate in physiological processes in the body. Uh, and you already explained that you can use certain drugs that can inhibit specific cell types better than others, right? right. But I, I was thinking if, if we might uh, elucidate it a little bit, elongate the explanation a little bit more in terms of hepatics uh, toxicity because I believe that autophagy is a really important mechanism in uh, empatocytes since they degrade various, various toxins in the body and uh, they had this depuration function really important to the human body. So uh, when it comes to these clinical trials that you showed us in the, uh, in the, at the end of your class, of your lecture, uh, do they have this hepatic cytotoxicity it is some it is of some concern in the clinic interestingly if you look at the clinical trials there's not really hepatic toxicity the two main toxicities you get in a person when you inhibit autophagy with chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine are um, retinopathies or injury to the retina and then the second one um, is really diarrhea so injury to sort of the gi tract um, but not to, you know, we may, these, um, clinical trials are really looking at, um, you know, all the toxicities. And if you, if you inhibit autophagy by itself, you don't really see, so you just give chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine to a person, you can see the retinal damage and you can see the GI upset. Um, but the rest of your systems tend to do really well. If you combine it with a drug that is, um, like a standard chemotherapy, like a temozolomide, um, 
and you put temozolomide and hydroxychloroquine together, you actually can't take as much of either drug together because you get immunosuppression. So they're working together and they're suppressing the, the white cells. If you combine it with a drug that's not um, immunosuppressive, like RAF inhibitors, you actually don't get any immunosuppression and you can max out your dose or you can increase your dose of autophagy inhibitor. And when they did studies in patients to look for what we call a maximal tolerated dose or the, the largest dose of autophagy inhibition that you can get, they didn't actually reach the maximum tolerated dose. They stopped because it was like, well, why would we go any higher? So when we look at um, drugs like hydroxychloroquine, which is used to treat um, things like um, uh, I'm totally blanking on what it's used to treat right now. Malaria, malaria, malaria. malaria. Yeah. Malaria. And then, um, other things you actually don't have to use that high of a dose. Um, and you don't use it for very long when we use it to treat things like cancer, the, the studies that are using it, they're actually using it in super high doses. And these drugs are, are lysotropic, meaning that they build up into the cell. And so it's got a really long half-life. It lasts for a really long time. It builds up really high levels within the cell. Um, and, and if you use it in the appropriate setting, you can use it safely. You just have to watch the retinopathy and the, and the diarrhea issues. I see. Well, thank you for the explanation. And I also had another question. May I? Yeah. Okay. So at the beginning of your presentation, you showed that you showed us that autophagy is important to in the period be between meals and that in nutritional 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 stress it develops mm -hmm. a functional role in the metabolism and at birth as well and mm -hmm. it kept me thinking because during my uh, graduation in a medical school uh, professors would tell me that uh, there is a physiological weight loss after birth due yep. to redistributing liquids and loss of liquids and electrolytes and i don't know if there is any any anything in literature that suggests that some of this weight loss may be due to autophagy um not that i'm aware of i mean i know if you if you block autophagy in these mice, these mice actually don't survive. They're not mm -hmm. able, you know, they're, they're born. And then as soon as their nutrient goes away, they, they die. Very they die because they, they can't, you know, survive that time frame. But I, I don't know if there's been any research of whether or not that's related to the weight loss that you see in infants after they're born. Okay. This autophagy induction, uh, during nu nutrient stress, it happens really fast, really quickly. Oh yeah. Okay. It's, it's almost an immediate response. You start okay. recycling very quickly. I see. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And yeah. congratulations on your lecture again. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys. Any other questions? Jean, you want to, you said that you have some other things to show us? Or yeah, want... so I was going to see, I was going to do this as just a little kind of a fun thing to think about. So... Let's see, we'll play this again. Okay, so if let's pretend like you are the person trying to decide whether or not you wanna use autophagy. So we're gonna talk about a disease called, called mucopolysaccharidosis or MPS. So this is where you're deficient in an enzyme that degrades these um, uh, aminoglycans, which is a complex sugar. There's different forms of MPS. And so MPS3A is something called San Filipino syndrome, San Filippo syndrome. Um, and we know that in patients who have this syndrome, they get increased number of autophagosomes in the brain. If we have mice models in the mouse models, we know that it decreases co-localization of LAMP3 and LC31, which suggests that the lysosome autophagosome fusion is not happening within these cells. We know that accumulation of autophagy substrates happen. So these, um, polyubiquinated proteins and dysfunctional mitochondria are building up because, um, you don't have good autophagy going on and decreased degradation of these aggregate prone proteins, such as in Huntington's disease and Parkinson's disease. We know that happens. 
So if we think about this disease that has increased fat, increased autophagosomes, decreased co-localization of the lysosome and the autophagosome, and an increase of these um, autophagy substrates, these proteins, let's think about, you know, let's think about how we know the system works and think, do we think targeting autophagy would be helpful here? This is where you guys have to participate. I actually know yeah. the answer. <laughs> Just yell it out. Do you, does anybody think targeting autophagy would be helpful here? Students. Yes, I, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it would. What would you do? Would you try and increase autophagy, decrease it or not change it at all? Maybe increase it, maybe promote it. Maybe promote it. Okay. Anyone vote to decrease or, or not change it? Come you're all on, in, guys. You're all, at, you're all at least A people. That's okay. I'll just make this, I'll make Gustavo answer everything. Not 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 grown up Gustavo, not teacher Gustavo, the other one. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So so Gustavo, you think targeting autophagy would be helpful, and you if you were to to um, target it, you would increase it. What kind of drug do you think you would use? Do you remember any of the drugs that we talked about earlier? I'm sorry, I, I do not remember. <laughs> That's okay. You've only been learning about it for like an hour. So this would be your Everolimus, your Alimus sort of method, right? You would want an mTOR inhibitor that would increase it if that's what your plan was. Yes. yes yep. And then you would monitor changes in autophagy using things like we talked about, like the proteins and stuff like that, like LC3. Yeah, I think it's a good strategy to yeah. monitor the, the content of polybicnated proteins and mm -hmm. autophagy substrates and also the formation of lysosome or autophagosome. Yep. So Gustavo has a good idea, right? Like the idea would be, okay, well, we're not breaking down these things. We're not breaking down the proteins like they should be breaking down. So, so maybe increasing autophagy would be helpful. The only problem with doing that in this particular disease is that the cells are able to produce lots of autophagosomes, right? It can, it has a lot of autophagosomes already. It's already taken up these proteins and got them in the autophagosome. The problem in this disease isn't that it can induce autophagy, it's that it can't finish it. So inducing more may not be helpful. You actually might cause a problem because all you would do is increase even more the number of autophagosomes in these, these neuron cells, but you're still not gonna be able to get those, those substrates to be broken down. So actually in this disease, you probably want to figure out not so much how to increase it, but how do we get this fusion to happen between the autophagosome and the lysosome? That's the issue. So you have the right concept and the right idea in that we're gonna, you know, the, the idea is we need to improve the recycling of this particular process, but unfortunately um, we can't really do that yet in this disease because we don't really have a drug that's good at making this lysosome autophagosome function work better, but you had the right idea. Good try. All right, now someone else is gonna to have to answer the next one because we're gonna make Gustavo do both. Okay, so this is osteosarcoma. So that's a pediatric bone cancer. It's about two and a half percent of all pediatric cancers and 20% of primary bone cancers. It is very chemotherapy resistant. It doesn't, chemotherapy doesn't work very well. That's why osteosarcoma patients are often, um, one of the primary treatment options is, is uh, removal of the tumor, which often causes um, amputation. And so we know that autophagy has been shown to promote chemosensitivity and it also has been shown to promote chemoresistance. So chemosensitivity in this case, if you give doxorubicin to these cells in the lab, it induces autophagy because it upregulates Becklin one. And then you get synergistic cytotoxicity and cell death in these um, osteosarcoma cells in the lab. But we've also shown that in these cells that HMGB1 mediated autophagy increases chemotherapy resistance if you block it. And that osteosarcoma grown and migration um, were, uh, the osteosarcoma grew, but the migration was decreased. So in this tumor, you actually have the balance issue again, right? Like how are we gonna make it? So this chemosensitive, we want the chemosensitivity portion. 
So do we think that targeting autophagy would be helpful in osteosarcoma? Someone other than Gustavo's student has to answer. It's just yes or no. Yeah, come on, guys. Let and there's not a there's not a right or wrong answer, right? This is we're scientists, and so our our right, goal is exactly. to ask a question and then figure it out, right? So there's no really, you know, if you if you answer wrong, it's just basically basically it's taking your hypothesis. Is your hypothesis osteosarcoma would be better treated with autophagy inhibition, or osteosarcoma would not be treated better with autophagy inhibition? Lucas. Oh, Michelle, you're going to call on people. Camila, Thales. How about raise Beatrice. your hand? Raise your hand if you think Come a talk would be helpful in treating the disease. You guys are also yeah. quiet. First, Professor, I'll try in on Go chemo because we tried another strategies and wasn't good. So I think in, in chemo resistance will be interesting targeting aut autophagy. Okay, so we're going to target it here. Would you yes. would you increase it or decrease it? In this case, increase, isn't it? No. Okay. Yeah, you can try and you can try and you can try. One of the things that you want to think about, think about this, right? So we yes. know that this HMGB1 mediated autophagy is increasing the resistance. Mm -hmm. So the autophagy within this tumor is causing it to be resistant to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. So in this case, you might want to consider blocking autophagy, right? Because if autophagy is helping the cell be resistant to chemo, you will want to block that autophagy. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to block autophagy in these cells, what kind of drug would I use? Do you remember any of the drugs we talked about that would block it? Mm. I know it's not fair to ask you guys that question because you've only been thinking about autophagy for like an hour. Uh, you <laughs> could use chloroqu chloroquine. Yeah, chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. Or probably hydroxy you okay. use. So in this case, it's actually really interesting because we know that here that doxorubicin is inducing autophagy and killing cells. So you don't necessarily want to block that. But then the cells that are resistant, they're the cells that are able to migrate and metastasize. So one of the things, and one of the, this is just sort of, and you guys wouldn't know this, but this is just sort of an interesting way that um, Professor Gustavo asked about targeting therapies earlier. So osteosarcoma um, metastasizes primarily to the lungs. So you wouldn't necessarily want to give something in the body that inhibits autophagy all the way because you want the cells to die from this doxorubicin induced autophagy, right? But what if you could deliver chloroquine or an autophagy inhibitor just to the lungs? because those are the cells that are chemo resistant. They migrate to the lungs. You could treat them with the topogy inhibition in the lungs only, and then treat with chemotherapy and try and kill the metastatic disease. So that's one idea. It's really hard to do, um, but it is a concept that people are thinking about. So you are right. Um, I apologize. I don't know. I can't remember the name of who was speaking, but you are right. You would want to target a topogy in this disease, but you'd want to think very closely about how you're doing it. You don't want to inhibit autophagy in the cells that are in their normal spot, but you want to try and see, can I inhibit autophagy in those cells that became metastatic? Because then I could kill those cells. Okay. I'm done torturing you guys with questions. <laughs> it's just a fun game to try and figure it out. Help you figure no, out. This it's game. wonderful. I mean, this is wonderful because uh, as I've been, you know, stressing out to the students, the important thing is to learn how to think to think scientifically, critically, not just to, you know, be a sponge of uh, concepts. So it's important to ask questions and, and it's important, it doesn't matter, as Jean said, if it's right or wrong, it's just the exercise of thinking, yeah. it's, it's much important. Yeah, I spent the first, so what, I spent literally the first 18 months in the lab with a zero, positive results, nothing, nothing worked for 18 months. I was so wow. distressed, right? But what that made me do is go back and reanalyze my question. My initial, my initial hypothesis was autophagy inhibition would improve the treatment of brain cancer. That was wrong, not entirely wrong, 
I had to change my view. I had to say, okay, it's not all brain cancer. It's specific brain cancer. I have to find a, something that, that tells me this tumor is going to be addicted to autophagy and respond to inhib inhibition. So that 18 months, although as sad and depressing as it was not to get any positive results, made me re-ask my question, relearn. I was wrong in the beginning, but I could come back around. And as long as you can think your way through the problem, you can readjust your hypothesis and figure out where you're going to go next. That's, that is all that science is, right? Exactly. If you get, if you get down because you're, you're, you're not getting the results that you think you're getting, take your results, spread them all out in front of you and, and talk about them with someone and say, okay, why is this not working the way I think it should work? And then start expanding your thoughts and going in other directions. Exactly. Excellent. Right. Any other questions? Anything else I can do with you guys? I put my, my, I put my email in the chat. Um, I'll stop sharing here. I put my email in the chat for people. And then also um, I'll make sure that my slides get to you guys somehow. They're uh, large, a large file. So I'm trying to figure out how to transfer it. That would be wonderful. Uh, and uh, also guys, if you, so we have Jean here, a system where we call these, um, the sandwich fellowships, where people from uh, master or from uh, PhD get to go abroad for either six, up to six months or one year. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a kind of a training, complementary training, but also a way to get to know scientists and then maybe pursue the postdoc, so which is good for both sides. It's yeah. The salary com comes from Brazil. So I, I, I think you're not aware of that. But, no, I'm happy uh, to have anyone who's interested, yeah. Our, I, mean, right, I do, so I do other is. research other than autophagy. I also study... Um, my autophagy is one is like half of my lab. And then the other half of my lab is, uh, looking at other, um, uh, epigenetic sort of things in brain tumors. And so I would be more than happy if for anyone who would be interested in coming for six months or a year, um, to come on over and come to Denver and work in my lab. And I'm happy to teach you guys and my, my lab people are great. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah. we will make sure to spread the world around. Here. Yeah, I would love it. I have, I have just two very quick questions. One was related to the result that you showed on the fast ligand uh -huh. versus trail sensitivity. Yeah. Uh, could it be related to the half life of these particular death receptors uh, mm -hmm. in the membrane? So if you, you know, recycle. Yeah. Faster than the other is, is that a possibility? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely oh, possible yeah. for, for, because if your receptor, if you don't have the receptor and you put the ligand out there, then it's not going to make a difference. And yeah. so the autophagy uh, recycling process being either slow or fast. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, okay. And, and the other thing is just, uh, I really don't know anything or much about the chaperone mediated, uh, autophagy. Mm -hmm. So, what are those those proteins that are targeted? How how do we evolve it to recognize this uh, the sequence KFERQ? Yeah, you know it's interesting because it's used a lot in um, if you think about it in immunology and infection. So it seems to be related a lot to like um, pathogen um, targeting, and then also um, in the aggregate protein targeting. And so it seems as though um, we have developed evolutionarily in a way to identify things that are bad for the body or bad for the cell. And this, um, for whatever reason, this KFERQ um, code, essentially oh, right. um, the body, you know, must be held in a lot of these things that are bad for the body. And then our body is just evolutionarily designed these um, chaperone proteins in order to recognize that and then get that, those specific pathogens or proteins into a recycling center. Oh, oh all right. So it's more, you, we don't see this particular sequence often in our own proteins. It's no, more no, related no. to the, mm -hmm. oh, okay. Yeah, it's, it's more related really to pathogenic, pathogenic proteins or yeah. pathogenic, like bacteria okay. and stuff like that. That's very cool. The immune system is, is the best. <laughs> it is very cool. 
It's really cool. It's really cool. All right, Jean. Thank you so, so, so much. Karina sent her best. She she, mm. she had to go to another meeting and oh, nice. she apologized. But uh, it was really awesome. And uh, you will be hearing from us. Well, thank you, you know, so much either, for it. <laughs> either, yeah, either for the students who contact you or for ourselves to invite you in person here. It would be great to have you. Yeah, please, anyone who wants to get a hold of me, like I said, my email's in the chat and um, I will get you the slides and my email's on the first slide. So don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Thanks. Have a wonderful day. Thanks a lot. See, see you guys tomorrow then. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye, Jean.